It's time for Dialogue this week. In this corner, we talk about a wide variety of issues ranging from culture and sports to the latest trend seen globally. Apparently, South Koreans have grown over five centimetres taller over the past 40 years, according to a report published last month. The Korean Agency for Technology and Standards Size Korea report found the average height of Korean men to be 6.4 centimetres taller than four decades ago, with an average height of 172.5 centimetres, or 5 feet 8 inches. Meanwhile, grown Korean women had an average height of 159.6 centimetres, or 6 feet 3 inches. That's around 5.3 centimetres taller than in the uh, late 1970s. That's not the only thing that changed. Apparently, obesity grew for men while decreasing for women. We discussed the changes to the Korean body over the last few decades, and for this, joining us today is Christopher J. Pe, Chair of the Department of Anthropology at the University of, of Hawaii at Manoa, and uh, Dr. David Kwak, Doctor of Family Medicine at Sung Tong Yang University Hospital here in Seoul. Very warm welcome to you both. And Dr. Pe, now joining us from uh, the beautiful sunny Hawaii. Now, the uh, size career <laughs> report showed that it showed not only an increase in height, but that also um, some South Koreans showed a more westernized body figure, while others kept the inherent Korean figure. So, first off, from an anthropological perspective, what is the standard Korean body figure? You know, uh, that's actually a very good question because it's very difficult to answer. Um, the reason is that there's so much variation within a population that uh, it's almost impossible to come up with one specific person that... Um, um, a good example of this, if you think about China and you think about Jackie Chan uh, and you think about Yao Ming, both two very, very, probably two of the most famous uh, Chinese people, right? Um, Jackie Chan is probably about 5'5", five five and, and Yao Ming is about uh, over seven feet tall. So you have a lot of variation within a single population uh, in that sense. So it's actually a very difficult question to, uh, to be able to answer. And we've done a lot of skeletal biological comparative analyses uh, related to trying to identify uh, what a Korean looks like. And for example, I've had um, students look at comparing between Korean uh, skeletons and uh, Japanese skeletons, modern skeletons, to see if they can identify distinct characteristics or traits on the skeleton that would say this is a typical Korean and this is a typical uh, Japanese. Uh, it is very, very difficult to be able to answer that question. Well, that is a very stark contrast indeed, Jackie Chan and um, <laughs> Yao Ming. But, well, in this report, for instance, can we say that there have been evolutionary changes in the body figure, particularly um, when it comes to the Korean body? Yes, certainly. Um, if you look at the data from four decades ago, uh, in general, Koreans were much smaller. Uh, and if you think about the impact of the war, you know, World War II and then the Korean War, socioeconomic-wise, um, it, it was very poor, right? Uh, you think about Koreans today, though, uh, socioeconomics, uh, it's, it's off the charts compared to 40 or 60 years ago. Uh, so basically, if you think about that in terms of nutrition and health, uh, Koreans are doing much better now than two or three generations ago. So it's not that surprising that uh, you have an increase in body size, uh, not only height, but also in, in, uh, in width as well. Uh, as a result of these changes in, uh, in diet uh, and health. Um, and, you know, the other point that you brought up about some Koreans having more of a Western body uh, structure. Um, when I first visited Korea in the, in the 1990s, uh, there were hardly any restaurants other than Korean restaurants and uh, Korean foods available. But, you know, you could go get Japanese food or Chinese food, but uh, Western restaurants were not that common uh, at that time, but you know nowadays, if you go to Korea, uh, Western food is, is readily available on almost every street corner. There are so many different restaurants and um, food that's available to a lot of people. Uh, you link that with travel. Uh, there's so much more international travel nowadays than, say, the 1980s. 
Americans are, are getting a lot of different experiences as a result of this. And so it's not that surprising that Koreans are becoming bigger, uh, not only taller, uh, but also wider and, and more um, in terms of their Western structure. So. Now, Dr. Kwok, uh, bringing you into the conversation. Well, we commonly tend to think that a person's height is in their genetic makeup, their DNA. So tall people tend to have tall children. But it seems that there are other factors that influence um, height, such as nutrition, health, environment. So how much of a person's height is really determined by their DNA? Well, I think at this state, it's most commonly accepted that the DNA composes up to about 80% of the determination for the height. But I personally believe that it's actually 100% instead of the 80% uh, because it's uh, the DNA's predetermination uh, for the height is actually what actually um, uh, maximizes, in the maximal level, uh, what determines the height of a person and nutrition and, and, and other types of environments that are actually factors that uh, takes toll on the maximum capacity of the height that can possibly happen in a person. So what I'm trying to say is that the DNA, when the DNA predetermines a person to be at a certain height, but let's say that he or she actually has to go through a very um, devastating uh, environment that uh, sort of lacks in nutrition or or puts him in or puts him or her in a position where uh, they have to be a, 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 go through a very anomaly um, situations, then they would take a certain uh, amount of height down reduction and from the maximum level. So. Uh, Commonly speaking, I think it's about up to 80% that the DNA predetermines the height, but uh, medically speaking, it, it's what actually predetermines completely of, the, of a person's height. And Dr. Kwag, do we stop growing at a certain age? And also, um, at what point uh, do environmental factors... Uh, so until what point uh, do environmental factors determine our height? Well, uh, up to a certain point, I think, uh, medically speaking, we believe uh, a person grows in height actually up to about 23 to 25 years of age, possibly. Uh, but we have different phases of the speed of growth in different ages as well. And that also happens differently for females and males. I, I believe uh, it happens. Um, uh, so there's a, uh, a phase, certain phase called growth spurt. Uh, which is the phase where a person grows mostly uh, during the phase, meaning uh, a person who is about, uh, who's supposed to grow, let's say, a centimeter or two within a year with, uh, during the time of growth spurt would actually turn to grow, let's say, 14 centimeters instead of the two. Uh, and that happens usually around the time of puberty uh, at around the ages of 12 to 14 for females and 14 to 16 for males. Um, so it is important that a person uh, keeps uh, at his or her best nutrition and best environment during that time, but obviously it will also matter for them to keep uh, in, in a good balance of diet and whatnot during other ages as well. Now, Professor Pei, in the last century, South Korea went through times of difficulty of the Korean War as well as well, more positive developments like economic uh, development and modernization. And well, what have these, uh, how have these historical factors really influenced the height of South Koreans? Um, they've influenced them enormously. If you think about uh, the fact that your children are probably bigger than you, uh, you're, you are probably bigger than your grandparents. And, you know, if your grandparents were born during World War II, grew up during the, uh, the Japanese occupation period, uh, life was very, very difficult for, for these people. Uh, you know, there's actually two famous examples out there. Um, you know, it, it, one of the famous examples is called the Dutch famine. Uh, during the end of World War II, um, there were several Netherlands isolated resources into, uh, into them uh, at the end of World War II, and so they ended up uh, going through a famine stage. So children that were born during this period, uh, because they weren't, you know, their parent, the mother was not able to get the, uh, the proper nutrients into, uh, into the womb, into the fetus, uh, ended up being a lot smaller uh, as a result. 
But what's interesting about uh, the results of the Dutch famine is that apparently it also carried over into the next generation as well, and it appeared uh, where they weren't still weren't able to um, overcome these uh, these problems. Uh, more closer to home, another famous example, though, are um, North Korean refugees or um, you know, people that are coming over with young children from North Korea. Uh, people have done uh, metric analysis studies of the skeletons, uh, skeletons of these, uh, these North Korean children, and compared to uh, children of the same age in South Korea, the children in South Korea that are the same age are, are usually almost always uh, much bigger than the, uh, the children from North Korea. And most people, most human biologists chalk this up directly to um, lack of nutrition. And, uh, and so that, you know, hopefully within uh, one or two generations, the North Koreans that are, that are being raised now in, uh, in South Korea uh, will be able to get closer to the mean of, uh, of South Korea in terms of overall body, uh, body structure. And Professor Pear, South Korea only has about 40 years worth of uh, statistical data on height, but based on your extensive research and understanding the human evolutionary record in East Asia, were the physical changes we're seeing now expected? That's to you, Dr. Pear. I, I think we should probably expect to see a slight uh, increase in body, overall body size still. Uh, if there's still an influx of, um, say, Western foods into, uh, in, into Kore regular Korean society, we're going to see uh, an increase in body weight, and it's probably not going to be uh, very good. Probably Dr. Kwok can speak on this as well, but if you look at uh, Western foods, especially cheaper Western foods that entered um, you know, the Pacific, uh, I live in the middle of the Pacific. I'm quite aware of this. So if, if you think about it from that perspective, uh, all types, of, you know, there were many different types of uh, health issues that arose with Pacific Islanders once they started to rely on these fast foods, uh, these Western fast foods. Uh, obesity, um, diabetes come, come, uh, come, come to become major problems with, uh, with these populations. And Professor Kwak, now, um, how important is diet uh, for children, um, teenagers in promoting growth? And also, how important are other factors like getting enough sleep and regular exercise? I would actually weigh in on the, the, the importance of sleeping over the, the importance of having a balanced diet. Um, as I said before, the predeterminants, uh, I think, is currently widely accepted to be the DNA, but uh, the, these nutritional factors and other environmental factors are what actually takes away the height from its maximum capacity. So in that regard, uh, physiologically speaking, while we are sleeping is when the growth hormone is excreted within our body. And that's what makes all the metabolism to grow, uh, make the, the growth in height. So sleeping is very important, but more importantly, sleeping at right hours is also very important. Currently known, the growth hormone are excreted from around 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. And that depends on the circadian rhythm for each different person. So it is very important that growing children, especially in their puberties, that they get enough sleep during those hours. And on top of that, the perfect balance in the diet is also what matters because those are the resources that will help uh, the metabolism or uh, through the metabolism that will actually end up uh, constituting the growth and height. Uh, what I mean by the balance in diet is really the perfect balance between vegetables, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and especially those dairy products containing calcium. So we're currently recommending all uh, children to actually consume not just particularly very eccentric uh, in their diet, because I believe some some these parents, some of the parents, uh, uh, especially in the Western uh, westernized lifestyles, worry about the figures of their children that they shouldn't. Uh, it's more important that they keep in a certain, uh, that they keep in a complete, well-balanced diet. But uh, as I've said before, I think it's more important that they also get good enough sleep at the right hours.
Well, I wouldn't mind being a few inches taller, but I guess I've lost the timing. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we must end the um, interview today. That was Christopher J. Pip, Chair of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and David Kwak, Doctor of Family Medicine at Sun Chonyang University Hospital in Seoul. Thank you again so much for your time today. Thanks Thank for you. having me.